Good morning. So I'm Lance Lee from uh, Taiwan. I'm currently affili affiliated to Institute of Atomic and Molecular Sciences, Academicenica, okay, which is a uh, governmental institute under president. So our job is to do fundamental research on it. Okay. Uh, so today my topic is uh, on CVD transition metal dichalcogenides monolayer for heterostructural stacking. So before that, I think uh, yes, the the uh, speech time is quite long. It's one hour, so I need to do something else. Otherwise, nothing. Speak too much. Okay. So uh, before I, I start my talk, I think I, I would like to thank my student and postdoc and also research assistants. So all the things cannot be done without uh, these guys working very hard. Okay. So we will start from the uh, graphene. Okay. Thanks. So graphene is a two two dimensional materials. Uh, uh, I think everyone knows this. So I think I would like to report uh, our recent uh, uh, progress in graphing. Okay, uh, it's not from fundamental research point of view. I'm, 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 I'm studying uh, sort of application side for graphing. So this is the uh, work we did in 2011. So this is a very simple uh, elect electrochemical exfoliation. Okay, so uh, this is basically like a high school experiment. So, let's see whether it works. Okay. Okay. So basically, we put the graphite, which is a cubic graphite or a large cubic graphite, put into a acidic water, which is sulfuric acid, and then we connect the positive electrodes to graphene, to graphite. So then, uh, if you increase the voltage to about 10 volts, so things happens. It's quite interesting. So you see a lot of uh, small flags is actually exfoliate very quickly from this uh, cubic graphite. Okay. So uh, since the graphite, uh, the, the graphene sheets exfoliate is actually very hydrophobic. So therefore, it looks like a very thick graphite flex there. But actually, if you try to uh, analyze the uh, sample, actually, you can see uh, actually. Uh, more than 70%, you can find those uh, very, very thin sheets. It's, it's kind of monolayer, bilayer, or trilayers, and it's up to 10 layers. So if you do proper uh, STM study and also STM cross-section, uh, TEM cross-section, you see this is a uh, quite high quality graphene rather than graphene oxide. So this is a very simple process. You can produce high quality uh, graphene flag. So it's very different from those uh, uh, reported graphene oxide, you need to do very heavily oxidations and then do reductions, and then you produce a lot of wasted uh, acidic water, so which is uh, very harmful for the uh, environment. So this is a very simple method. And then uh, now we are uh, in lab scale, and and then uh, we are at a stage in the industry scale now. So uh, so with uh, one production line like uh, like, like this say. Uh, uh, electrochemical cell, you can produce about 30 kilograms per year. Okay, we are talking about high quality graphene sheets rather than uh, th those uh, 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 very, very thick particle layer. Okay. So, uh, so you can do very simple process. You can put uh, 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 graphite at both electrodes. You can do alternating voltage or just do exfoliation. But anyway, it's quite easy to get those uh, graphene sheets in a powder form. So these kind of graphene sheets can easily can be easily just transferred. Uh, uh, if you form a film on the surface, you can transfer it onto uh, your targeting substrates. So now we are having very very uh, condensed or uh, very concentrated graphene uh, solutions. And uh, the the potential applications for this kind of uh, graphene actually there there are many many different applications. Uh, so we are looking at this graphene uh, graphene flex. So naturally, we are thinking about very, very simple, I would say very low-end application rather than those electronics. For those low-end applications, uh, we are thinking about uh, uh, energy-related things because this kind of uh, graphene sheets is very con conductive. So you can mix them, uh, you put it into the uh, uh, lithium-ion battery cathodes or anodes. So you can you can use it as a binder and also increase the conductivity to reduce the uh, electro resistance. And then sometimes if you have a proper control of the functional group on top, so you can have a uh, capacity enhancement. So sometimes you can go beyond the theoretical limit for those uh, uh, 
uh, uh, uh, uh, oxide particle. So it has still function inside. You can, you can have a higher capacity. It can also have higher conductivity. So that's the one thing we are working on. And then uh, uh, another uh, large scale application is actually for thermal conducting uh, sheets like this. So we still uh, exfoliate graphene sheet. You can easily just uh, doing uh, coating things. You can do multiple coating. And then you can, uh, for example, you do the coating on the left hand side, this white paper. And then you can exfoliate from, you can just peel it off as a sheet here on the right hand side, which is highly semiconductive. So the conductive, thermal conductivity is comparable to synthetic graphite, but the thickness is controllable, it's depending, how, uh, depending on how, how many layers you are depositing. So with this, uh, with this such kind of a solution, and also this uh, uh, film formation process, so it is possible this kind of thing can be used for uh, future, I would say, uh, shrink electronics. You need to dissipate the heat. So this is, this is one of the applications we are thinking about. Okay. So uh, uh, we do this very quietly and very slowly. So we form a graphene uh, reaction in Taiwan, uh, starting with the company called Nitronics, who uh, it is working on the graphene sheets exfoliations, and then uh, and then we do the collaboration with another uh, new startup company, uh, lithium ion battery powder company. As I mentioned, we want to uh, put lithium, uh, put graphene sheet into the castles. So this is another powder supply company. And then uh, we have another company who is interest, uh, which is interested in thermal, uh, he uh, thermal heat, uh, heat dissipation. So then we have this uh, starting from this three company and try to, uh, to increase the number of company. So uh, basically, industry doesn't really know uh, too much how to use graphene at this moment, I think, at least in Taiwan. So we do it very slowly and we try to build out a website, it's called 2D website. Currently, we are having only Chinese version, so we are going to do that later for uh, English version and try to advertise and try to increase the, uh, the, the member, number of member. So you can see, uh, we update it every day from the figures, you can see, so now, uh, it happened to me today, it is uh, Singapore related. It says Singapore invests a lot of money in three-dimensional graphing, graphing things. I'm not sure what it is, but anyway, it says uh, it's very aggressive in Singapore. Okay, so we update this every day, so we want to advertise and to give information to the societies. So that's the thing we, we are working on. Okay, so then uh, to go back to the, the, the main topic. Uh, graphing is a zero-gap semiconductor. Okay, but uh, we heard a lot of things about graphene. So electronics and after electronics actually requires gap, uh, a material with a gap. It will be easier for, for, uh, for them to do the application. So therefore, uh, it is quite useful to search for other two-dimensional materials. Okay, for example, uh, I draw a very simple diagram here. I think everybody knows this. On the right-hand side, it is a, a fantastic material, boron nitride, uh, with a high uh, energy gap, about 60 electron volt. So, which is a very good insulating materials, which is monolayer. On the left hand side, we have a very highly conductive material, which is graphene, without energy gap. So, in the middle, is actually, there are many, many uh, choices of semiconducting materials. The entry level material is molybdenum disulfide, so you can also have a tungsten selenide, you have also gallium selenide. There are different uh, options. So, those materials are actually with energy gap. So, there are many, many the different building blocks you can use for electronics or other materials. So, why people are interested in two dimensional materials? Because if you have. Excuse me. Okay, sorry. Yeah. I cannot hear the voice. Okay, so uh, why we're interested in two dimensional materials, and uh, particularly in constructing those building blocks? Because. Uh, if you have nice building block, like a CVD graphene or CVD uh, MOS2 or dichocogenize, then you can try to build, I think I copied the, the figure from somewhere else. You, uh, you can build up actually, as you wish, you can put the things on top and then build a three-dimensional, it's not crystal, it's a cluster. And then depending on how you measure or how you stack the, the things, you measure, you can measure vertically or you can select one layer and do horizontal measurement. Depending on the materials, the number of layer or uh, stacking pattern or doping level for each layer. So you can do also do surface modification to change car, uh, car densities. Actually, you can have a new properties. I think this is uh, uh, actually 
uh, I think this is what we want to advertise in this. So everybody is doing this. It's quite interesting. Uh, here I show a very good example. I think yesterday we have, uh, we have seen this picture. Uh, I think I still need to uh, mention again. So this is a very, very nice work by Andrew Gam's group. Okay. So basically, you don't really uh, measure the horizontal properties of graphene. So now instead, it's actually you sandwich uh, the boron nitride or a uh, few layers of boron nitride in between two graphene layers, and then you measure the uh, vertical tunneling, uh, tunneling behavior So between these two graphene layers. So then I can use backgate to control the uh, energy alignment between these two graphene sheets. Then you can turn, you can, you can change the, uh, uh, the electrical transport property from very uh, high conduction to low conduction. So then you have very high on ratio. So this is a very nice example that you can, you, can, uh, you can come out new properties just by stacking those two-dimensional materials. So I, th I think this is a very, very interesting uh, area. OK, so basically we are uh, there are many, many choices which is are available in the literature. These are all very, very ancient uh, uh, study so uh, a few, 10 years ago. OK, so depending on the materials, uh, the mat metal you are using, you can have a uh, Say, for example, group 4, 5, 6, 7, and even 10. You combine them with uh, sulfur, selenide, and tellurides, or you can mix them together to, to form the alloy. It doesn't matter. And then you can actually form a monolayer with, uh, with uh, controllable properties and controllable band gap. So all this property probably can be d explained by this uh, molecular orbital uh, structures. So I'm not going to talk too much on that. Yeah. OK. So. Uh, I think I need to quickly go through this uh, very simple uh, uh, features of this uh, MOS2. Uh, so MOS2 is basically you have a three, uh, three uh, atom layer. You have top layer sulfur and bottom layer sulfur. In the middle, you have molybdenum. And then uh, uh, they have a two, uh, basically two forms. One is H form, the other one is T form. For H form, it is uh, semiconducting. So for, for T form, it's metallic. So metallic form in this case is actually not really that uh, stable. So for most of the cases, uh, people can get only semiconducting uh, form, H form, which is a good news for uh, electronics. Okay. Uh, but for T form, it's more uh, active in, in catalysis. So uh, they're, they're, they have their unique application. OK, so thickness dependence. And I think we heard a lot from bulk to single layers. Actually, uh, from they can change from indirect gap to direct gap. And the gap is actually uh, increasing. And there are also, uh, I think the first day, uh, the, the, there, there was a very, very wonderful talk on uh, uh, spin optical coupling and the spin, uh, I would say, valetronics. Uh, I think I'm not going to uh, talk too much on this. I think this is uh, spin tronics is one. Uh, I mean, valetronics is also another. Uh, possible application which is attract a lot of physics is doing this. Okay, and in terms of electronics, uh, uh, Andra Kiss uh, should talk about uh, a lot of the low power and the high performance electron and um, based on this MOS2 layer. I think this is the, uh, I mean, uh, this paper actually stimulates a lot of people's interest in working on electronics, particularly electrical, electrical engineering. Uh, I think uh, the mobility at room temperature now probably is at 100 centimeter, yeah, centimeter per ball per second, something like this. Okay. Uh, uh, since MOS2 is having a very broad scope of application, so I'm listing down s uh, several. So, for example, balletronics and nonlinear optics. I mean, still, I think it's still not, not, not very clear what happened for those monolayers if you do uh, optics measurement. And superconductivity, a Japanese group has already demonstrated superconductivity for MOS2. And the second thing is the low power and flexible electronics, uh, whether there is any possibility for the future. So, the third thing is optoelectronics. You can do photo detection, that's for sure. And what about photovoltaic cell from this uh, PN junctions uh, of monolayer PN junctions? To still to, uh, need to, I think it still needs to be verified. Okay. So uh, and then uh, for energy story, uh, energy storage, for example, lithium battery or supercapacitor. I think it's very obvious because uh, these materials are actually layer, so you can insert the lithium ion in between the interlayer space. To, so, so then you can perform some uh, applications. You can uh, uh, explore application for this uh, energy storage. And then another very useful application is for uh, catalytic uh, properties. Yeah, because you have MO and sulfur bonding. 
So I think for molybdenum, selenide is also quite similar. So uh, those uh, sulfur or selenide, actually, they can donate electrons to proton. So the proton can be reduced to hydrogen. So it is a quite good catalysis for hydrogen generation, which is considered to be very useful in the futures. So actually, you can, uh, you can use a solar cell, solar panel to, to produce the electrical power. And then using electrical power uh, to generate hydrogen, so if you have a molybdenum, very cheap molybdenum disulfide catalyst, OK, that's a, a way to generate a, uh, energy without using a carbon cycle inside. OK, okay. so uh, how to prepare the monolayers? I think I found several uh, literature in 2011. So uh, the Coleman's group are using a very simple uh, sonication, uh, the ultrasonication process. It's just put this uh, powder, bulk foam. And bulk foam powder is actually in, in organic solvent. And then do a uh, long time extended sonication. They use the sonication power to exfoliate, to break the uh, vendor wall interaction in between the layers. So that's a uh, very beautiful work. And then uh, Zhang Hua School is actually using a, a very interesting method. Is they take, they, I think they borrowed the idea from lithium ion battery. They insert the lithium ions into this uh, uh, layer structures, then weaken the Inter, inter, uh, inter uh, layer layer interactions, and then they can easily just break the uh, uh, vendor wire interaction between layers. Just put a very simple and mild sonication. So this is also very fantastic. You can produce in large amounts. So uh, Chihuahua group has actually uh, used another method, which is also quite interesting. They use a very strong base. It's called uh, normal beauty lithium in organic uh, synthesis. Normal, uh, normally, people use this kind of uh, very strong base. So they use this strong base, try to exfoliate. It's, it's actually peel off the, uh, the, the, the layer. So since they have very strong uh, shearing force during the process, so therefore they can have a two edge phase and also T phase. So remember, the T phase is very useful for catalytic reactions. So they have recently published a very, very uh, good paper just uh, talking about the, uh, the, the T phase. For edge phase, I mean, active size is actually on the edge. It's not, not on the basal plan. But if you use the T phase, okay, so the whole surface actually can be uh, uh, electroactive. So they largely just improve the catalytic properties if you have a, a good T phase. So, okay, so in, your, in our groups, we are more interested in large scale application. So uh, we start to work on the uh, CBD growth in 2010. Okay, so uh, at that time, I think we try many, many different approaches. The first approach we try. It's very natural. We want to use a uh, uh, molybdenum metal. So we evaporate very thin layer of molybdenum metal on top of insulators, and then do uh, sulfurization. So this is a very, very naive chemistry. Uh, then uh, since that, uh, we have very limit, uh, we have very, uh, 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 we, we're concerned a, a lot on uh, the safety of the gases. So therefore, we don't really want to use hydrogen sulfide at that, at that time. So now, uh, actually, we, we, use, uh, we start from the sulfur vapor, which is safer for us. OK, so then uh, you end up with that. If we do, we, we do the sulfurization, actually, we introduce sulfur vapor at high temperature so into the chamber, try to do sulfurization of molybdenum metal. So you end up with that. We have a, a molybdenum disulfide film, which can be confirmed by Raman. However, when we do the electrical measurement, it always shows that it looks like a resistor or a metallic film. It is not really semiconductors. So this indicates that yeah, we, uh, we still have a lot of defect inside. So those defects actually destroy the uh, band structure or the properties of so MOS2. So therefore, uh, we give up this uh, first approach, which is a uh, uh, sulfurization of metal. OK, so uh, then uh, we try to think about what kind of thing we should do. So initially, we think about ALD process, so which is very natural. So we need to find out uh, different uh, molybdenum precursors, which is volatile at certain temperature, at low, at low temperature. So we start from molybdenum uh, chloride, okay, which, is, uh, which is OK. But uh, when we do the sulfurization, we found that we cannot really remove all those uh, chlorine, which is corrosive, and then also degrades the property of MOS2 a lot. So therefore, we gave up. Uh, molybdenum chloride. So then we try to find out those uh, molybdenum uh, organics, organics, metallics. So organic metallic is normally used for uh, vapor phase CBD or uh, M MBE process. Okay. Uh, so let's imagine that uh, 
if you are talking about hafnium oxide, for example, you are using hafnium organics with a lot of carbon ligands inside. And then you are actually depositing a uh, very thick layer of hafnium oxide, for example, 20 nanometers or 30 nanometers. So, so therefore, the carbon contamination from the ligands, a little bit of contamination doesn't really, really decrease your hafnium oxide too much. I mean, I mean a property. But actually, we are now we are facing a, 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 a synthetic process for monolayer, which is only <coughs> one 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 uh, one uh, molecular layer, which is only one nanometers. So you ha if you have some or a carbon contamination on top or on the grand, uh, or at grain boundary. So it would just seriously degrade the property of this MOS2 film. So therefore, so uh, intuitively, we don't want to use a carbon, carbon containing precursor, so metal organics. So therefore, we start from those, uh, the precursor you don't really want to use, which is a metal oxide, molybdenum trioxide. Okay. The reason you don't want to use it because it's with very high boiling point or melting point. It doesn't make sense to use the molybdenum oxide to start with. But after very careful consideration and, and, and several trials, we think molybdenum oxide maybe it's, it's not too bad to be a, a starting precursor to work on. Because if you have oxygen inside, it doesn't matter. We can do other things, try to pull out the oxygen if you have proper method. So based on this, a very simple uh, uh, naive thought. We we work on. Uh, we try to start to work on uh, uh, the reactions between molybdenum trioxide and we suffer. That's that's the uh, rationales in the beginning. Okay, so we start from uh, molybdenum trioxide thin film. We deposit very thin. We try to control the thickness on top of uh, uh, sulfide or insulators, and then we do sulfurization. Uh, the, the same process as the first one. Okay, so. Uh, yes, we can get molybdenum sulfide film, but it is very difficult to control the, uh, the, the eventual thickness of molybdenum disulfide. In particular, people really want to have monolayer or controllable thickness. So uh, I think initially, if you, if you uh, I think initially it's, it's, it's also very difficult to control the thickness of uh, molybdenum trioxide or molybdenum oxide. And in particular, when you heat it up, the molybdenum trioxide will be uh, degrade to MOS, MOO2 or other uh, oxide form. So the thickness is actually vary a lot. Uh, at least I, th I, I think we don't have very good control for the thickness of MOO uh, MO oxide, molybdenum oxide. So, so therefore the second approach is also, I think doesn't make sense to me. So then we start to work on uh, other two approaches. It turns out to be that uh, we can have a proper semiconducting property for MOS2. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'm going to talk about these uh, two stories, actually. So the first uh, process uh, is, a, I, I call it uh, all-in-one precursor. We have, a, this is a commercially available, so this uh, precursor is actually contains molybdenum metal and also sulfur inside. So everything is inside. So what you need to do is actually just do thermal degradations uh, if you have hydrogen inside, they can promote the thermal degradations, and then you can form molybdenum disulfide easily. So actually, we copy, we, we got this uh, uh, equation from literature, this ancient literature. So we copy this process. We try to do, to see uh, whether we can get a good thing from this. So the process is very simple. We uh, we dissolve this precursor in water or in organic solvent like a DMF, and we do a very simple dip coating or spin coating. And uh, that, that's still not enough. You need to thin down the uh, precursor actually on top of this uh, uh, insulator. So then we, we do an uh, air brush. No, we, we just flow a very high flow. Uh, it's like air gun. You try to thin down the, uh, after you, after you, after you uh, spin coat the precursor on top, you try to thin down this as thin as possible using air gun. Okay, and then you do the first reaction like uh, thermal degradations. Uh, sorry, the first uh, thermal degradation based on these, this equation. So we set, set the temperature at 500 degrees C. So it, uh, we found that, it, yes, it is possible to have MOS2, but it contains a lot of oxygen contaminations based on our XPS analysis. Although the oxygen analysis is not really accurate for XPS, but it is a good indication that we still have a lot of oxygen within this film. So how to solve this issue? Uh, as I mentioned, I think it's very important to remove those, this oxygen. So then uh, we, we develop another process 
It's very simple. We just put the sample back to the furnace and then raise the temperature to 1,000 degrees C for extended time. And with the presence, uh, with the, uh, without the presence, uh, I think, without the presence of hydrogen, okay, we just have high temperature. And also, most importantly, we put in a sulfur vapor inside. So the sulfur, sulfur vapor is not only the element to form uh, molybdenum sulfide, it is also a good reduction, reductant, which can reduce the, uh, the uh, which can perform the reduction reaction inside. So we have oxygen inside, so therefore sulfur vapor seems to be a very good uh, and a very mild reductance for removing oxygen. And then, uh, so then we, we, after we do this process, actually it forms a quite uniform and a quite good uh, film. So if we examine the oxygen content by XPS, so the uh, oxygen content is actually uh, largely decreases. And 6.7% is not really accurate because when we take out the sample, we expose to ambient, so it absorbs a lot of oxygen, we, we, and then we move into the XPS chamber. So the actual amount of oxygen should be lower than this value. But anyway, we don't really uh, uh, seriously look at this, this issue. But we know if we do the second annealing process, we suffer. So we can have very nice quality of MOS2. And also, this MOS2 is actually transferable to other substrate. So if you, you, you can just follow the uh, process people normally use for graphing. So you deposit polymer PMA on top, and then uh, edge down of the, uh, uh, you edge down the underlier, underlying substrates, like uh, you can use sodium hydroxide to remove those, I should just add, add the interface between molybdenum disulfide and the glasses or sulfide. So then, then you can do a very, uh, you can easily do the transfer to under another. Okay, so. Initially, we use uh, silicon oxide or sulfide. Yeah, so both can work. Yeah. And so we do a very uh, we do the characterization. It shows that yes, it's, it has a certain uh, degrees of uh, crystallinity, which is not too bad. So I think most importantly, when we compare the the two sample, one is with second annealing with sulfur. So the other one is without second annealing. So just uh, follow the fir first, uh, I mean, first hydrogen degradation. So you can see the mobility value uh, uh, changes lots. Actually, you can enhance uh, about uh, two order magnitude just by putting the uh, sulfur vapor uh, soaking process inside. So these are the uh, statistical data you can see here. So this is a very large improvement. Okay. So what can we use for this uh, uh, sample? So uh, we had a collaboration with uh, uh, Professor Takenobu in Waseda University. So they have a very special technique which is called iron gel gating. So uh, then we try to transfer our tri-layer. So I, I forgot to mention, uh, using that process, we still cannot easily just get large area. I mean, just centimeter size uh, 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 MOS2 in mono layer, I think. We can get mono layer, but it's separate. It's it's always separated. If we want to have a, a continuous and very integrated film uh, uh, with centimeter size, I think the, the, the best things we can get is tri-layer. The thinnest thing we can get is tri-layer. So at that time, we, we were thinking about flexible electronics. So therefore, we were actually aiming at uh, continuous film. Okay. So we transfer those uh, tri-layer continuous film. It's large, I think it's large size and then transfer onto a uh, flexible substrate called polyimide. So people normally use polyimide for uh, examining the uh, flexible flexibility of the electronics. And then they deposit uh, ion gel on top. Uh, ion gel is kind of a, uh, it's like a liquid or like a solid. It's, it's in between. So they can use it as a solid electronics uh, with a lot of ion inside. And then, and then they, uh, after they deposit those ion gel on top, they can just simply put on a uh, PT foil on top as a top gate. So actually, you are using PT top gate through this ion gel to your uh, MOS2 film. Okay. So then, uh, when they do the uh, uh, the device, actually looks like this. Uh, although it's very ugly, but they can help to do a lot of uh, very simple characterization. For example, uh, they measure the electrical property. Uh, uh, when they uh, actually they at the same time actually they wrap the devices on. Uh, thin needle. So depending on the diameter of the needle, it's actually you can control the, uh, the, the curvature or bending structures of this film, these devices. So surprisingly, 
So they see no big changes on uh, electrical properties. So it's actually, uh, this data actually tell us that uh, MOS2 is having uh, extremely good bendability. So based on this data, I think uh, most of polymer actually uh, having very comparable uh, performances. But uh, if we consider uh, 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 very common sense, right? When we learn in high school, we know MOS2 in organic material is always very brittle. So it's not suitable for uh, flexible electronics. But uh, when, we, when we look at the scale now, we are, we are thinking about monolayer, trilayer things. It's, it's, it's very, very thin. And the chemical structures tell us that there's no big difference between this kind of structure with polymer because all these things are actually uh, covalent bonded. So it looks like a two-dimensional polymer. So basically, it can be used for uh, flexible electronics. I think a, uh, for MOS2, if you, further the, uh, if you further enhance the mobility of this film by processing, and it is already having very, very good mobility compared with uh, polymer. And also, they, uh, if you have very good capping technologies, you try to avoid oxygen attacking this MOS2, which is normally what people do for, uh, for polymer. So I think there's a chance uh, MOS2 can be used to replace uh, the current polymer because the mobility is much higher than polymer electronics. So, uh, and also it's very thin and very transparent. You're not using very thick polymer like a, a 100 nanometer. You're only using one nanometer or two nanometer thin film. So this is a, uh, one possibility for future flexible electronics. So I, th I think yesterday uh, there was talk, uh, talking about strain electronics. Right? Uh, Thomas talked about it, strain electronics. And I think this is uh, another example. Sorry. Uh, so we did a collaboration. We sent a film to Hong Kong, uh, Polytech, by Professor Danny Rao. So he uh, uh, transferred this uh, trilayer film on top of PM and PT. And then apply by after applying electric uh, uh, voltage, they can control the uh, size change of the substrate, and then they can induce uh, the, the comparable size change of uh, MOS2. And then they observe very large uh, photoluminescence peak shift. So actually, because this is tri-layer, it's quite complicated. So uh, you still can de deconvolute this peak to indirect gap and direct gap. So the basic the conclusion from their paper is that uh, indirect gap doesn't change uh, as significant as direct, uh, sorry, sorry, direct gap it doesn't really change as significant as indirect gap, which is consistent with the theoretical uh, calculations. Okay, so uh, those are related to the first process, uh, trilayer formation using O in1 precursor. So now, uh, so after we passed through that paper, uh, people are still requesting a lot of, uh, I think we got a lot of emails requesting us to form whether we can provide monolayer MOS2. So uh, follow the rationale I just mentioned, we start to work on uh, molybdenum trioxide with sulfur, do sulfurization using uh, molybdenum trioxide. Okay, so the setup is very straightforward. So we put a molybdenum trioxide in the middle of the furnace, and then uh, it's set up at 650 degrees C, and then uh, we put a sulfur vapor, a uh, sulfur powder outside, and then heat it with uh, 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 lower temperature says 200 degrees C, or between 150 to 200 degrees C. And then we use a, uh, uh, argon as a carry gas to bring the sulfur vapor, so passing through the uh, regime with molybdenum trioxide vapor, I think, at that temperature. And then we put our uh, targeting substrates in the downstream side. So then you can collect uh, MOS2 uh, flex. So uh, if you look at an uh, uh, optical microscope, uh, with very low concentration of molybdenum trioxide, oxide, uh, metal, uh, metal sources, you can form those uh, triangle shape, uh, uh, single crystalline MOS2. But if you have a higher concentration, you control, you have higher concentration of molybdenum trioxide, so you can form continuous film, but uh, they, uh, the grain size is rather small compared with the left-hand side. If we do the AFN image, it's, uh, it shows clearer pictures. So this is the uh, uh, larger size on the left-hand side. You have a separated uh, uh, single grain and single crystalline uh, MOS2 sheets, which is uh, 0.7 nanometers in AFN. 
And on the right hand side, you have high concentration things. So, and the AFN image was uh, taken just before they merged together. If you increase the growth time, then you can, you can have a continuous film as shown on the bottom. So uh, AFN cannot tell you too much, but you can see a lot of uh, sort of very, very small triangle. So this is not too surprising because at higher concentration of molybdenum trioxide, you can have more nucleuses. So, so you can easily just have a very dense and very small uh, crystallized structures there. Okay, so, uh, so those growth is actually more uh, smoothly you can get uh, on sulfide substrate because sulfide is crystallized structures. So as long as you have a good nucleus on top and then you can grow laterally. So if you, you can have a proper control, you can, uh, you can grow a, a larger size of uh, single crystalline MOS2. Uh, but if you want to grow on silicon oxide, so, so I think there are uh, other papers uh, talking about the, the way. So you can do treatment, you can do a lot of things, try to, I don't know what happened, but maybe you increase the roughness or other things. But it's actually you can grow a, a, a single crystalline molybdenum sapphire on top. But we use a very, very simple process, which is called seeding, okay, rather than treatment. Okay. So we found that it is always work every time when you do the seeding. So if you don't do the seeding, uh, I think for us, our system, we don't really see much success in growing MOS2 on uh, amorphous silicon oxide. So after we do the seeding, so the seeding process is very simple. You can use graphene oxide, or you can use uh, other aromat aromatic molecule. So you just spin coat the, uh, the, the precursor on top of substrate, like silicon oxide, or you evaporate those uh, volatile organic molecules, which is, it has to be aromat aromatic molecule. Okay. So you have aromatic mo molecule on top, and then you do the, the same, exactly the same thing, and then you can grow uh, a large area, I would say large size single crystallized MOS2 easily based on uh, silicon oxide film. Okay. So recently, a MIT group has actually uh, performed a series of study. They <coughs> examined about 30, more than 30 aromatic precursor. So you all work out quite well. Okay. Okay. So uh, let me go back to the, uh, the, the argument before. Uh, so I mentioned that MOS2 is uh, extremely flexible. So here we can sh uh, see the evidences. So uh, if you do the growth, it's actually uh, on, so you happen in, in our wafer, we have a silicon particle, okay? And then you can see these triangle things, which is the MOS2. They're growing on top of this very rough surface silicon particle. So, uh, and also the, in the middle graph, it's actually you can see this is a titanium oxide aggregates. There are a lot, a lot of nanoparticles, and then they form an nan uh, aggregate there. But you still can see MOS2 single crystalline growing on top of this, say, uh, titanium oxide aggregates, which is actually, again, confirms that the MOS2 is extremely flexible. They can just put on any rough surface. Yeah, which is not very surprising, yeah, if we listen to the talk yesterday. Okay, so uh, another question is that uh, uh, whether this kind of CBD, synthetic uh, film, can be used for uh, electronics. So actually we had a collaboration with uh, Thomas Palacios. So actually Dr. Li Yixian is actually working in uh, MIT uh, together with Stan using the film, CBD film. So uh, I think they published paper in uh, I mean last year in IEDM, which has attracted a lot of attention. So, uh, so basically, uh, comparing with a, a mechanical exfoliate, uh, the, the, the MOS2, actually synthetic process, uh, synthetic MOS2, uh, it looks not too bad. I mean, they have this uh, uh, mobility is around 190. I think after correction with the bottom, uh, 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 I mean, uh, con considering coupling between this top gate and the bottom gate, the value is around <laughs> 30 something, okay, which is not too bad. And the substructure string is around, uh, is less than 100 millivolt, okay. So although it's, it's still large, but I think it's, uh, it still have room to improve, okay. So at least it demonstrates that synthetic MOS2 is not too bad compared with uh, me mechanical exfoliated one. So, I think we listened to many talk in this conference. I mean, people mentioned that maybe contact becomes more important, or uh, scattering at the interface, maybe dominating. So I think uh, as long as uh, I think someone can solve these two issues, so we may be able to see better performances. Okay. So in that paper, it's actually they made a, a circuit. It's like a very simple circuit inverter, and also NM gates, and it performs quite well using remember using CBD growth. 
uh, MOS2. Okay. Is there time? Uh, five, five minutes. minutes okay. Including QA. Okay. I'm sorry. So I think I will talk about a little bit on tungsten diselenide. Okay. So uh, tungsten diselenide, I think the one key point is that you can use the same thing, tungsten oxide, some tungsten trioxide. And then uh, the key thing is that you need to introduce uh, a little bit of hydrogen to activate the dissociation cleavage between tungsten and oxygen. And then you can get the same thing, as I mentioned, like MOS2. For MOS2, you don't need to use hydrogen. But for tungsten trioxide, you need to have hydrogen. Otherwise, it's very difficult to grow. So you can have, uh, uh, if you look at the electrical properties like ambipolar behavior, so it's, it's very different from MOS2. MOS2 is basically, the Fermi energy is actually very close to conduction band. And for tungsten, di for tungsten diselenide, we think that it's actually is in the middle, so in, in between conduction and balance band. OK, so uh, one theoretical paper says that actually you can have this uh, tunable uh, metal, I'll, I'll say t uh, t TMD alloys. Uh, so we try to verify that. So we have a simple process. We have a, a MOS2, and then we do selenization, try to use selenide to replace the sulfur. So they, it worked out, work out quite well. So we can see the band energies, the uh, band gas is actually ch uh, tunable and change, uh, changeable with uh, the process, the temperature we are using. So basically, this replacement process is thermodynamic control. So you can tune the energy between 1.57 to 1.86. So if you look at the TEM, so it shows the quite homogeneous distribution. So these are the selenide, selenide, these are the selenide sulfide. So you can have a, a look, this is very homogeneous. For tungsten diselenide, so you can also do the same thing. So the energy is actually tunable between 1.65 to 2.0 volts, like this. Okay. So I think I will just uh, Okay. So uh, I think I, I just run out of time, and then I will quickly just run to the conclusion. So since we have uh, capability to grow MOS2, tungsten selenide, tungsten uh, uh, molybdenum selenide, and another tungsten sapphire, so now we are trying to stack all these things together, try to build all the heterostructures. So we are more interested in the band offset, band alignment between these materials. So we are working on the band alignment, so how to uh, work out the band offset not by uh, photocurrent study, just by looking at the synchrotron, we look at the co-level shifts. So, uh, so we, I, have, I, have, I think I haven't really summarized the data, but anyway, uh, these are the, uh, the, the very basic thing. When we put the things on go, and then we can see the Fermi interval, and then we can see the span structures. When you put them together, I think they shift a little bit, so those are the things we are interested in at this moment. So uh, those are also the things we are keen to understand, because whether we can really get uh, photovoltage from this uh, two-dimensional layer stacking. Uh, I think still a is, is not confirmed yet. Okay. Uh, okay. So our conclusion is that a study of the property of heterostructures uh, it may be of great interest. As you mentioned, uh, as, uh, uh, we have a lesson in, in this conference. There are many, many talk talking about the layer-layer interactions. And the other important things I think is that we still need to have a proper process to, uh, I mean, we have, we, have, we have to have a <coughs> proper tool to study the uh, growth mechanism and also see whether we can have a wafer scale uh, uh, a process to grow a wafer scale. Only by doing wafer scale process, then you can uh, attract the interest from the company, from industry. So that's the very basic things. So therefore, we are building a very strange looking home-built uh, CVD. So this looks like an uh, advanced version of a CVD. So, so we are going to test very quickly, see whether we can have a, a better understanding for the growth process. Okay. So I will say uh, thank you very much. And then uh, I would like to acknowledge all the uh, international collaborators and also funding source, from, particularly from NSC, Academia Seneca, and also Air Force a little bit. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much.